Hello and welcome. I planned to make this video about almost a year ago, but to my shame it took a very long time to get everything for a final cut. Today I am going to talk about my very first donation from a viewer of my channel, which I got about a year ago from Paul in USA. First of all, Paul, I really apologize about the huge delay. I've been working on this video on and off all this time, but somehow I couldn't finalize it. And today you will hopefully see why. So let's now jump back to August 2021. In the package there was a handwritten letter from Paul, which I found very nice to be honest. He wrote, Hey, would like to thank you for all the great content. I, and I'm sure many others, continue to learn from this. As we discussed, here is a small pile of retro stuff that hopefully may see the light of day again sometime. As the historian David Attenborough said, you can do more and more and more the longer you live. But the best motto to think about is not to waste things. Don't waste electricity, don't waste paper, don't waste food. Live the way you want to live, but just don't waste. All the best, and hope you are a Matrix fan because also included some new sunglasses. Paul. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'm glad if you guys take something useful from my videos. But as I often say, I just share my hobby with you and you always should take everything I say with a grain of salt. From time to time I do my mistakes and you also should keep this in mind. I see my channel more like an entertainment and a place for inspiration. In regards of not wasting things and feeling responsible for our environment, I couldn't agree more. We have only this one planet, and we desperately need to take it seriously. You know, besides retro hardware and software engineering, my other big hobby is diving and underwater photography. These are some of my pictures, which I made all over the world. And the thing is, that underwater you often see what people above the surface are not able to see. Unfortunately, a lot of what you can see there is disgusting. I participated many times in underwater cleaning events and, doesn't matter how much waste we pull out of the sea, there always remains a lot more. So I join Paul, agree with Attenborough's words and appeal to every one of you. Take care of your environment, don't waste things and please keep our beautiful planet clean. Well, let's continue and see what we have inside. Here are the promised Matrix sunglasses. I'm clearly a huge fan of that film. I love when you have to think about a movie after you watched it, and I had Matrix for weeks in my head all the time. I was heavily impressed as it came 1999 and saw it 100 times ever since. Very cool. Ok, here is an ISO sound card from Yamaha. Actually a great card for DOS gaming with outstanding compatibility and real Yamaha OPL3 FM sound. As I understood from the communication with Paul, this one is defective and I'll have to take a closer look at it. Well, this time it is a PCI sound card made by Ansonic. Shortly after this card was introduced to the market, Creative Labs understood that they missed the PCI audio train completely and bought the company Ansonic to re-release this card under the name Sound Blaster PCI64 which evolved later to Sound Blaster Live. Ok, and now to the most interesting part of this donation, a nice Pentium 2 mainboard. It is based on the glorious Intel 440BX chipset, one of the most successful chipsets of that time. Very stable, highly compatible with support for AGP and frontside bus up to 100MHz. The chipset was so rock solid that some manufacturers even overclocked it from factory to 133 MHz and made it usable for later Coppermine Pentium 3 CPUs, which were designed for that frontside bus. Talking of CPUs, this board, except slot 1 CPUs, has 4 SDRAM memory slots and beside the named AGP also 4 PCI slots and 3 ISO slots. That is very extendable. The board was made by TDK, model PRM0080i. Paul wrote in the email that it used to work perfectly, but a failing PSU appeared to have took the mainboard down with it. He was not sure if the BIOS was corrupted as he recalled seeing gibberish on the screen when trying to boot. Well, first of all, I see some scratched and maybe even leaky capacitors. 
So I will have to replace them. Second, the main board is really dirty. There is a lot of gunk everywhere, so first of all I'll have to wash it, since dirt can also be a reason for failures. To remove this additional CPU cooler holder, you have to push such pins in the middle through the stands and then you should be able to pull the holder out of the board. Actually, this is only needed if you install a CPU with an extra big cooler, which often was used for the early versions of the Pentium 2. They could get quite warm, but I don't have such a CPU with such a big cooler, so I don't actually need this holder at all. The chipset for 40BX can get hot too, but not too much, so usually such boards have only a small chipset cooler and they don't need any thermal paste. However, this one even has a small thermal pad. Time for some cleaning. Just as always, I use some water, soap and a soft brush. After some soaking in the water, all the soap has to be properly washed away. I love the golden color of this board. It comes out really nice, since this board has a lot of freestanding ground plates. Now I just have to put the board into a warm, dry place and wait until it gets dry. So it's been about 24 hours and the board is now clean and dry again. Let's give it a try and see what happens. Here I have some CPUs which should fit. Let's see what I have for the slot 1. This is a 450 MHz Pentium 3, which I often use for testing. It needs 100 MHz frontside bus and should actually work on this board. But let's use this so-called slot get adapter. This can be used with socket 370 CPUs in a slot 1. Here I have a Celeron 433 and I like to use it because first it needs only 66 MHz frontside bus and second it has no cooler so I can film with my thumb if it gets warm when powered up. Please don't do this with faster CPUs, or you will burn your fingers. However, for this CPU I have a minute to make some measurements until it gets really hot. Here I have some memory, even with ECC, which should be supported by the i440BX. As a graphics card I'll use some random PCI card, doesn't matter. I will need a PC speaker to hear post beeps, and we'll connect a power button for convenience. Let's see. Yep, the CPU gets warm, that is a good sign. Oh, and I already see the output. Yeah, just as Paul wrote in the email, there is absolutely some gibberish on the screen. But I can clearly see Celeron CPU at 433 MHz message and 128 MB memory counter. The part of the screen above the message seems to be messed up and the system hangs completely, not even numlock on the keyboard reacts. Let's try to reboot a couple of times and see if something changes. Nope, it's every time the same and since the failure looks the same as how Paul described it, I guess I don't need to try another CPU, memory or graphics card. He definitely tested the system with the different parts than what I have. Ok, on such old mainboards with the CPU power supply on board, capacitors can degrade over the time so much that CPU voltage gets unstable. Furthermore, Paul said that there was a broken PSU in play and over voltage could theoretically damage some parts and capacitors could have been suffered as well. So it's worth it to give it a try. Some capacitors don't look very nice anyway anymore, so I will replace them. However, I don't have the required caps in my workshop and I will have to order a pack. As many of you guys probably heard, the worldwide chip shortage affects many areas in the industry. Unfortunately, the shortage is not only limited to the ICs, but also less sophisticated parts like capacitors. No joke, but in Germany I would have to wait up to 4 months for the required caps. And even in China I couldn't get what I exactly needed. As you see, I got these yellow caps made by company Ymin. I never used these caps before, but with up to 10,000 hours of duty they should be very good according to the distributor, who was very reliable so far as well. We will see, but this is what I could get so far. 
By the way, when you order the replacement caps, you should always try to get the same capacitance, where the voltage is allowed to be higher on the replacement caps. As you see, my new caps are quite a lot taller, but they also should stand voltages up to 16 volts, where the old capacitors were specified for up to 6.3 volts. That's fine, the higher the allowed voltage, the lower the temperature of the capacitors will be, and so longer its life. So you see, caps with higher voltage are also usually bigger, but in my case this shouldn't be an issue, but sometimes you have to keep this in mind. And once again, if you search for replacement caps, look for the same capacitance and at least the same or higher voltage. Furthermore, if you want that your caps live longer, search for caps with maximum temperature at 105 degrees Celsius. In my case, the voltage of the new caps is higher and the caps should be of high quality, so I guess I will never need to change them again. Meanwhile, I found this Pentium 2 266MHz CPU, and this shall be our next victim. Again, I'll use some random AGP graphics cards which I currently have at hand. Well, that's unfortunate. The new caps didn't improve the situation and we get still the same broken image. Later, I made a lot of measurements, tested other CPUs, copied the BIOS to another flash ROM, compared it to the latest one from the Ultimate Retro project, and it was the same. I tried all kind of stuff, but I couldn't find anything wrong. The CPU voltage was fine, all the clocks were ok, and I was out of ideas. So, I did what I always do in such cases. I put the board into my to-do box until I'll get new ideas. And there it was another couple of months. One day, I again found some time to play with this board. I went to the Ultimate Retro project once again and found the main board there. I don't remember how it was as I tried it last time, but this time I suddenly realized that there were BIOS versions 1 and 2. Thankfully, there was also the original documentation for this main board in different versions. In the older version, only compatibility with Pentium 2 was mentioned, where in the later version also Pentium 3 was listed as supported. First I thought that maybe there was just a BIOS upgrade somewhere in between, but the main board is the same. However, as I went down to the jumper settings in the latest documentation, I realized that for the multiplier settings there were four jumpers, where on my board there were only three. So I opened one of the earlier revisions of the documentation and there were indeed only three jumpers. So obviously there existed different revisions of this board. As I said before, I compared the BIOS which was originally in the flash ROM as I got this board, and it was the latest version 206. But there was still this version 1 as well, and maybe different BIOS versions were made for different revisions of this board. So I slowly came to a feeling that the memory played a trick on Paul, and he mixed some other case with this one, so maybe I was just confused by an initially wrong information. Luckily it was very easy to check, so I fetched the BIOS version 1.15 and wrote it to a flash ROM using my TL866 programmer, and as soon as I inserted the right BIOS, the system instantly started to initialize properly. As you see, the Pentium 2 266 was properly detected as well. Reminder on myself, doesn't matter which information I get, double and triple check the jumpers and the BIOS. As you see, the BIOS version is 1.15 and the system seems to pause now. Also the keyboard works and I can enter and navigate the BIOS settings. The CPU voltage is at 2.9 volts. It should be at 2.8, but is still within acceptable limits. Okay, in the documentation was said that this revision of the mainboard is compatible with Pentium 2 only. But theoretically, the chipset should also work with the Pentium 3. I have this Pentium 3 500 in my spare parts, which is specified for 2 volts. Let's insert it and see what happens. Ok, the board posts again and the voltage is on point 2 volts. That is perfect, but the CPU was detected as Pentium 2 as you see. At least the frequency is right. Let's move on and try this copper mine Pentium 3 866 with 133 MHz frontside bus. 
The main board supports only 100 MHz, so the CPU should be underclocked, but the voltage should be now at 1.7 volts. And we are getting 1.7 volts indeed. So at least in regards of voltages, this main board seems to handle everything down to 1.7 volts and should be able to run with Pentium 3 just fine. However, if we look on the screen, now the main board seems not to post at all. The CPU detection seems to fail completely. It just says MMX at 98 MHz and refuses to continue. Well, anyway, this is a huge step forward. The main board starts again and sets even the right voltages for all of the tested CPUs. As far as I know, there is not always a use case for all main boards with this chipset. Some very early models didn't support anything else but 2.8 volts. So, if the voltages are ok, can we do something to enable proper Pentium 3 support on this board? Yes, we can. There is a tool named BIOS Patcher, which can add the required microcode and CPU IDs to the BIOS. I will not go into details now, because this deserves a separate video, I guess, but I patched the BIOS and renamed the BIOS version into 1.15-1 by Necroware. Let's see if it works at all and if we see any difference. Let's go all in and directly try the Pentium 3 866, which I left from the previous tests in the slot. And BAM! Would you look at that! The BIOS version is 1.15 underscore 1 by Necroware. And the detected CPU is Pentium 3 at 650 MHz. It even tells which core the CPU has, copper mine in this case. Very cool! This time the system posts. The CPU is designed for a frontside bus of 133 MHz, so the internal multiplier is set to 6.5 to get to 866 MHz in total. But since this main board supports only 100 MHz, we are getting eventually 650 MHz, so the frequency is totally fine. Now let's try again the Pentium 3 500. Ta-da! This one gets now also detected properly and reports Pentium 3 Katmai at 500 MHz. Perfect! Now the ultimate test. Let's insert the compact flash to IDE adapter with my 2GB card with DOS and test tools and so on. And see if we can boot into DOS at all. And congratulations, we are in DOS. Let's see what Season 4 has to say. Well, Pentium 567 MHz is obviously wrong. This tool is probably too old for the system. But the CPU identification utility reports Pentium 3 500 properly at 100 MHz frontside bus. And what a test without Doom benchmark, right? We are getting 656 real ticks. This is about 113 frames per second. And Quake? 109.6 frames per second. Superb! I will have to do some stability tests, see if everything is ok, but so far I am super happy about this board. I will upload the modified BIOS to the Ultimate Retro project, in case someone is interested as well. A big thank you to Paul once again for this great hardware. Sorry that it took so long for this video to come out. However, I already know where I will use this mainboard. Believe me, I am planning to make a very nice DOS and Windows 98 PC, which I will use for hardware tests and gaming in the future. I have some amazing ideas what I would like to have in it, so if you guys are interested, subscribe to not miss it. And of course, I did not forget the Yamaha sound card. I also made some tests of camera and it is indeed broken. However, maybe I have an idea what it could be and should I make any progress, I'll try to make a video about this one too. Well, and this is it for today. At least the lesson which I learned once again was always check the BIOS first. Doesn't matter how much you think to know about the board. I hope you enjoyed this repair. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.